Let me uh, say what a delight it is for me to be here tonight to be a part of this, but it's been a delight to be here all day and to hear these great messages. I've been edified, built up, and uh, certainly wish that I could be here for the entirety of the event. have to head home and head to Texas tomorrow, but I'm thankful that I got to be here for tonight. Let me say one quick word about Brother Matthew uh, and his directorship of this lectureship. Uh, he's handled it like an old veteran, if you ask me. It looks like he knows what he's doing, and uh, so you might want to latch on to that guy and keep him doing this because he's definitely in his element doing that, and we appreciate the invitation of the elders to be here and of all the members who work so hard for an event like this. Lectureships don't happen by accident. They are definitely a team project, and we're grateful for the team. You've done a great job here. Thank you so much. And it wasn't written for our law, but it was written for our learning. That's what Paul says about the Old Testament Scriptures in Romans chapter 15 and verse 4. And part of that Old Testament material includes the books of Ezra and Nehemiah and Esther. And Ezra and Nehemiah address head-on the matter of whether a loving God would ever expect a couple that is unscripturally married to separate because they are unscripturally married. What would God say about this, though, if the unscripturally married couple has children? What would His attitude be about that? And you and I don't have to speculate about whether a loving God would ever require such couples to separate because we actually have legislation in the Word of God about that. And may I say as I start this message tonight that it's impossible to address this issue without appealing to an authoritative standard. What would you think of the idea if I suggested it that, you know what, since a lot of people in the world have questions about marriage and divorce and remarriage, we need to give them some guidance. So let's choose 35 to 40 individuals from this room, send you all off into a room, and tell you, you come up with the rules for marriage. What constitutes a scriptural marriage? How to end a marriage if it's ever right to end one? How to remarry if it's ever right to remarry? You 35 to 40 hand-picked individuals by us, Go off into a room, figure it all out, let us know your findings, and when you're finished, we'll publish them on the internet and, in, and tell the entire world, you have to go by this. What do you think would happen if we tried that particular method? I know what would happen. People would say, well, who do you think you are? You 35 to 40 people are to tell us how to live when it comes to marriage. What gives you the right? Well, that's a good question, but you know what? What if God selected 35 to 40 individuals and empowered them by the Holy Spirit to speak what He wanted spoken, to write what He wanted written? Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit, 2 Peter chapter 1, 20 and 21. Now we're getting into a whole different arena because Scripture is breathed out not by 35 to 40 human beings who just have human wisdom. Scripture is breathed out by God, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, and then written down by God's appointed writers, His inspired spokesmen, His inspired penmen, and those writings constitute the authority for matters that pertain to life and godliness. And marriage is certainly a matter of life that exists on this earth. Now, you know, it's always fascinated me the atheist has no way of explaining marriage and laws for marriage to us. In fact, if we ask the evolutionist who doesn't believe in God, tell us who was the first couple to ever be married on the planet Earth. Point them, tell us when was the first man and the first woman, when did the first man meet the first woman and actually come up with the idea of marriage. If you divorce yourself from this book right here, you have no idea what the answer to that question is because there is no way that that would ever be known. But God told us exactly when the first marriage was brought into existence. It's when, as it were, God walked Eve down the aisle, so to speak, gave her unto Adam, 
And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. And then Moses adds this inspired editorial comment, Therefore shall a man leave father and mother and cleave to his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. The word of the Lord is right, Psalm 33, 4. All of God's commandments are truth, Psalm 119, 142, and also 151. And I want you to know that Jesus said, Thy word is truth, John 17, 17. And so tonight I want to make it clear, anything that I say that comes from this book, you and I are both accountable for. Uh, if I'm giving you human opinion, that's one thing. But if it's coming right from the word of God, then that's something by which we'll all be judged. So let's talk about God's standard at the beginning for marriage. Let's go back to that very familiar text in Genesis. Everything that God had made was good, in fact, very good. And then finally, something that's not good. The first thing stated to be not good is that man should be alone, Genesis 2.18. But God's got a solution for that. And so the Bible tells us that He takes man and causes him to go into a deep sleep, verse 21, took one of his ribs, closed up the flesh instead thereof, and the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made a woman out of that, and brought her unto the man, and that's when Adam said what I noted a moment ago that he said about this is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. And then the statement was made, they need to cleave, not leave. And so that's the biblical beginning. I find it fascinating that God did not bring two females to Adam and say, Adam, here are your wives. Adam was not given a man and told, here is your helpmeet. God did not choose to give Adam a male. He chose to give him a female, one. One female and it was his intention that Adam and that one female be joined together as husband and wife until death did them part. And so that is God's early standard. It's easy to see. No one has to uh, be, you know, make it complex. It's not complex. Well, it didn't take long for us to see some early departures from this standard. Go to Genesis 4 and look at verse 19. The Bible tells us that Lamech, took unto him two wives. Now, if God had wanted that from the, at the beginning, he could have given Adam two, but he gave him one. Lamech gets the idea, not from God, that he can have two. And then in chapter 6 of Genesis, we see that the criteria for choosing a wife became very, very shallow because in verse 1 of Genesis 6, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them, the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, oh, beautiful to behold, and they took them wives of all which they chose. They based it on their outer appearance alone. And you'll note that later in Genesis chapter 26, when he was 40 years old, Esau took him two Hittite wives. And what does the Bible say about how that worked out for him and how it worked out for the rest of the family? You remember the Bible goes on to say, quote, these women were a grief of mind to Isaac and Rebekah. But I'd like to show you Deuteronomy 7 because it's very important to understand this text before we get to the text in uh, Ezra chapter 9 and 10. In Deuteronomy chapter 7, God who authored marriage and thus has the right to make the rules regarding it, and let me make that observation before we get to Deuteronomy 7, since God is the creator of marriage, it's His. He is the one who has the right to decide what it's going to be and what it's not going to be. If I show up at your house with a bucket of paint and a sledgehammer and tell you that uh, I don't even knock, I just walk right in, you're going to say, well, 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 what do you think you're doing? I'm here to remodel your house. What do you mean, remodel my house? I don't like your house. I don't like the way it looks. I'd like to make it look like I want it to look. So I'm going to take this sledgehammer and knock down that wall because I don't like it. 
and I'm going to take these buckets of paint and I'm going to paint your walls the color that I want them to be because that's what I want. Now, how long would it take for you to tell me, and hopefully you would tell me remembering you're a Christian uh, in a nice way, how long would it take for you to tell me, um, excuse me, this is what? This is not your house. You have no right to come into our house and tell us how you want it to be. You can build your own house and make it the colors you want it to be, but you have no right to take our house and make it look like you want it to be, remodel it to your specifications. Friends, if you don't like, if I don't like the rules God has given for marriage in His universe, then here's what you do. Go out and create your own universe, create your own human beings, and you can tell them what laws you want them to follow for marriage. And you say, but I can't do that, and that's exactly right. Because you and I cannot do that, we are not smart enough, powerful enough, we bow before the one who could do it, who did do it, and we honor his wisdom. That's what we do. And so in Deuteronomy chapter 7, what did he tell those Old Testament individuals under that covenant he wanted them to do regarding marriage? He told them what he didn't want them to do, point blank. He says in verse 1 of Deuteronomy 7, When the Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land, whither thou goest to possess it, he's cast out many nations before thee, and he mentions all those nations there in verse 1. Seven nations, he mentions. Verse 2, when the Lord thy God shall deliver them before thee, thou shalt smite them, utterly destroy them, make no covenant with them, nor show mercy unto them. Watch. Neither shalt thou make marriages with them. Thy daughter thou shalt not give unto his son nor his daughter shalt thou take unto thy son. Why not? For they will turn away thy son from following me, that they may serve other gods, and so will the anger of the Lord be kindled against you and destroy thee suddenly. Now there's no indication in the text that the people said, well, God, you don't have any right to tell us what to do and not to do when it comes to marriage. No, they understood he had every right to tell them. And it's also interesting that in the text he said, if you ignore my will on this, you're inviting a disaster. You're inviting my anger to be kindled against you and for you to be destroyed suddenly. And so this was clearly legislated. I don't want you marrying these individuals from these foreign nations because they'll turn your hearts away and cause you to serve other gods. If you don't believe that's spot on, ask yourself, what happened to Solomon? What happened to Solomon? Exactly, we read in 1 Kings chapter 11 what happened to him. Solomon loved all these different women from all these different nations and they introduced their idolatrous ways into his universe and that caused him to turn away from following the Lord. And with, by the time we get to Ezra and Nehemiah, we're talking about a thousand years approximately from the time that Deuteronomy 7 was recorded. And so what had happened in that thousand year period, what had happened recently in the time, go to Ezra chapter 10 with me tonight, if you will. Ezra chapter 10. And notice that Ezra had prayed, as we heard mentioned in the great sermon on Ezra chapter 9. And when he had confessed, weeping, casting himself down before the house of God, there assembled unto him out of Israel a very great congregation of men and women and children. The people wept very sore. Now a man by the name of Shechaniah, who was the son of Jehiel, one of the sons of Elam, he answered and said, Ezra, we've trespassed against our God. How so? Have taken strange wives of the people of the land. Yet now there is hope in Israel concerning this thing. And that hope is, let's just tell everyone, okay, now that we realize that we messed up, you can stay with the wife you're with now, just don't do it again. Is that what your Bible says? What was the solution suggested by Shechaniah? Watch verse 3. 
Now therefore, let us make a covenant with our God to put away all the wives and what? And such as are born of them. According to the counsel of my Lord and of those that tremble at the commandment of our God and let it be done according to the law. Because we respect the word of God and tremble at its authority over us, we know that we never had a right to enter into these relationships in the first place. And thus, the positive suggestion that we're making, though a difficult one emotionally, is that we put away all the wives we never should have married in the first place. And yes, we know that's going to involve some of the fact that there are children involved in this, but still, nevertheless, God's Word says what it says and we have to do it. Now, this would have been a perfect time for Ezra to say, Shechaniah, that's a real overreaction. You have really become legalistic, haven't you? To say that, no, you, Shechaniah, what we're going to do is tell them, okay, this was wrong, you shouldn't have done it, but you can stay with them as long as you say, God, I'm sorry. You can stay with the wife that you married that you never should have married. And you, sh you can stay with them and just don't ever do it again. Does, does Ezra say that? Yes or no? He doesn't. In fact, Ezra agrees with this solution. Because watch what he does in verse 5. And notice verse 4 has a little phrase in it that we're going to come back to a little later. Be of good courage and do it. It takes courage to do the right thing when it comes to this subject. It takes courage to do the right thing when it comes to preaching on this subject. It takes courage to do the right thing when it comes to actually applying this to our lives and to the lives of our children that we love and people that we know. But in verse 5, Ezra, and he arose and he made the chief priest, the Levites and all Israel swear that they should do according to this word. He did not reject this statement from Shechaniah. He says that's right, that's what needs to be done, and he made, he made the chief priests and the Levites and all Israel make a promise they would do exactly that, and they said they would. Now, Ezra is so anguished over this, he won't eat bread. He won't even drink any water. In fact, verse 6 says, if you'll notice, he, quote, mourned because of the transgression of them that had, had been carried away. This was not a pleasant situation to deal with. A proclamation is sent to all of Israel in Jerusalem telling them, look, everyone needs to appear in Jerusalem within three days. And we're going to start dealing with this matter. Now, I would tell you that, I would like to tell you rather, that there are folks in the Lord's church today who, if they find out there's an issue with marriage, divorce, and remarriage, are going to be courageous enough to deal with it. But I've known of too many situations where this attitude was present instead. Well, that's unfortunate, but... No one really knows about your situation. There's no need to broadcast it, no need to publicize it. So let's just go on like we've been doing. Friends, these people are summoned to Jerusalem. We've got to deal with this. And so you'll notice that when all of the men of Jerusalem uh, gather together there in verse number 9, all the people, it's the ninth month, 20th day of the month, they're they're trembling because of this matter, and it's also raining. I mean, it's a tremendous rain. It was a rainy season, and the, the rain is coming down hard. Ezra the priest stands up. I want you to notice what he says. He does not say what some brethren today are saying to individuals today who are in marriages they never should have entered because they weren't scriptural to begin with. Ezra stood up and told that audience, quote, ye have transgressed and have taken strange wives to increase the trespass of Israel. 
Now therefore, make confession unto the Lord God of your fathers and do His pleasure. Now that's where a lot of people want to stop reading. Just confess you shouldn't have done this and that'll be pleasing to God and, and just don't ever do it again. But Ezra doesn't say just confess. He says, make confession unto the Lord God of your fathers, do His pleasure and, and what? Separate yourselves from the people of the land and from the strange wives. What was the reaction of the congregation to such a difficult command? Did they say, are you kidding me? You expect us to leave these relationships we've been in for all this time? And you know, some of us have children. You know that, right? I want you to notice what they said. Ezra chapter 10 and verse 12. Then all the congregation answered and said with a loud voice, As thou hast said, so must we do. We must do this. You no, know, it's not something we want to do necessarily, but we must do it to do right. We've got to do what's right. They didn't accuse Ezra of being legalistic about God's marriage laws. They didn't say, you've obviously misinterpreted the Scriptures. They said, you're right, we're wrong, and we need to fix it. They didn't argue that their children exempted them from having to obey this command. They consented to do what God's law said to do, no matter how emotional, no matter how hard. That doesn't mean there weren't any tears. There were plenty of tears. Look at verse 1 of Ezra 10. Ezra had prayed, and when he'd confessed, weeping, casting himself down before the house of God. And then look at verse 4. It's going to take courage to do this. We also will be with thee. Be of good courage and do it. As a leader, Ezra knows I've got to take leadership and I've got to try to get them to do the right thing. And this is not going to be an easy thing, but it must be done. Because watch verses 18 and 19. Even some that were in the priesthood had taken strange wives. Verse 18, among the sons of the priests there were found that had taken strange wives. It even starts giving some of their names. And then verse 19, they gave their hands that they would put away their wives. And watch next, being guilty, what did they do? They offered a ram of the flock for their trespass. And this is where some brethren would say, well, since you offered that ram for your trespass, that means you're forgiven of having entered into this relationship, and now you can stay in it. Because you had... A sacrifice offered for it and that gives you forgiveness and now that you're forgiven you can stay in this. Friends, that is not what they... They didn't argue, well, because we've offered a sacrifice for our trespass, that forgives our past transgressions and we can keep our wives that we took unlawfully. Instead, beginning in Ezra 10 and verse 20, you start seeing... Don't skip over it. I mean, you may not want to read the names, I understand. But starting there and continuing for 24 verses, it starts listing name after name after name after name of those who had married unscripturally. They're identified. And then Ezra 10.44 explains, and this is how the book ends. All these had taken strange wives, and some of them had wives by whom they had children. Now tell me, why that's mentioned here again. Why is that emphasized here again? If ever there were a chapter in the Bible that would address whether God would ever expect an unscripturally married couple with children to realize they don't need to be together, this would be the chapter that absolutely settles it. It's in the Bible. That doesn't mean everything in the Bible is easy to read or easy to practice, but it's for the best. I'd like to tell you this is the last time any problem like that has ever happened, but look at the book of Nehemiah. About 12 years after Ezra brought his group home from captivity, here comes Nehemiah, and then Nehemiah serves as the governor for about 12 years. 
He goes back for a while uh, to Babylon and then comes back again. In Nehemiah 13, when he comes back, what does he find? Nehemiah chapter, uh, well, go to chapter 10 first. That would be even better. Nehemiah chapter 10, the Bible says in Nehemiah 10 and verse 29, all the names you see in the first few verses there of Nehemiah 10, you say, well, what, 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 what are these names listed for? They signed a covenant. They signed an agreement, sealed their names to it, saying we promise that we will do that. What did they promise? Watch verse 29. They claved to their brethren. They, they claved to their brethren, their nobles, and entered into a curse, into an oath, to walk in God's law, which was given by Moses, the servant of God, to observe to do all the commandments of the Lord, His judgments, His statutes, and that we would not give our daughters to the people of the land, nor take their daughters for our sons. They said, we're sign our names on the dotted line to that. And then in chapter 13, you'll notice that when Nehemiah Gets back, he has to deal, verse 23, in those days I saw, what did you see, Nehemiah? I saw Jews that had married wives of Ashdod and of Ammon and of Moab, and they had children, he said, and these children couldn't even speak the Jewish language because of the foreign influence. So Nehemiah says what? Well, you know, these kinds of things have to be, I, I, let me show you what Nehemiah did not do. I actually know of an eldership because my dad used to be decades ago before this happened, the preacher at this church. I know of an eldership that went to a conference in Nashville, Tennessee that was on the subject of marriage, divorce, and remarriage. And when they came back from that conference, the eldership stood up before the membership and said this, you know, we just came back from a conference on the subject of marriage, divorce, and remarriage. There are so many different ideas in the brotherhood about this by so many good people. So many different views on it by so many good brethren. We have decided that we don't really have a position on it here. And so we're not going to be asking you any questions about marriage, divorce, or remarriage. Brethren, may I suggest to you that this idea that God didn't give us enough info to really figure out the truth on this subject is preposterous for this reason. Does 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 9 say that adulterers shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Does it say that? Galatians 5, 19 to 21 makes it clear that adulterers or fornicators will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do you think for one moment that Almighty God said, I'm going to damn people's souls for this, for being guilty of this, but I didn't give them enough clear information to figure out whether they're guilty of it or not? I'm not going to tell you whether... Uh, you're an adulterer or not. I'll make it so fuzzy you can't even understand whether you are or aren't, but I'm still going to damn your soul for it. That makes God, that would make God a monster, which he is not. It's clear enough. The Bible is true and clear on this subject. And Nehemiah minced no words. He contended with them in verse 25. Actually, curse pronounced a curse. It doesn't mean you swear words here like we would say when we curse in our culture today. But he cursed them for their conduct, smote certain of them, plucked off their hair, made them swear by God, saying, You will not give your daughters unto their sons, nor take their daughters unto your sons or for yourselves. And then he points them to Solomon. Do you not remember what happened to Solomon when he did that? Verse number 26, shall we then hearken to you to do all this great evil to transgress against our God in marrying strange wives? He calls it great evil, and yet some people want to suggest that we're getting all too worked up if we act like it's a big deal. It's, it's still true that it, it's, it's a big deal. It's a big deal. Now, I want to 
close out this message tonight by dealing with the standard according to Jesus and some uh, departures that we see existing because of uh, man's apostasy from the original standard of Christ. Did Jesus change the truth on marriage because he lived in more modern times? On the contrary, even though centuries had elapsed since the first couple entered the Garden of Eden at God's creation, Jesus, the Creator, involved in the creation Himself, all things were made by Him. Without Him, there wasn't anything made that was made. He keeps to the same standard of marriage that we read about in Genesis 2, and He doesn't modify it. He's he had points men back to it. When the Pharisees wanted to know, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for just any reason? Jesus pointed them to the beginning and said what the Scripture there said, God made them to cleave, not to leave. And what God has joined together, let not man put asunder. So His standard for marriage and divorce is based on, have you not read? Isn't it fascinating that all of the questions that we have about any religious subject can be answered by a reading of the revelation of God. Jesus, when He was asked about this by the Pharisees, says, have you not read? The information you're seeking is already in what you're able to read. Have you not read it? Do you not accept it? And this reference to the beginning is important because He doesn't cite cultural trends of His day. He says the authority for marriage law goes all the way back to the garden. It didn't start with Christianity. And so this idea that non-Christians are somehow not amenable to God's marriage law can't be true because God's laws for marriage were never exclusively connected with the Christian system. They've been since creation. Now may I point out to you that Malachi 2.16 says God hates divorce. And may I point out to you what for years I didn't even know until I, I got more interested in studying the Bible more earnestly as I grew older. I knew Matthew 19.9 was in there, but you know I'd never read Mark 10.11 and Luke 16.18. And I want you to read them with me now because for some perhaps this is going to be a eureka moment of I said, whoa, I didn't, I didn't realize that. For others, you already know it, but for those who may not know it, let's go to Mark 10. I want to show you something that we read in Mark chapter 10 and verse number 11. His disciples have asked him about some things that uh, were mentioned by the Pharisees, and then watch verse 11. He said unto them, Whosoever shall put away his wife and marry another committeth adultery against her. Um, do you notice anything missing from Mark 10, 11 that's in Matthew 19, 9? Matthew 19, 9 has something in it that's not in Mark 10, 11. And if you'll go to Luke 16, 18, you'll notice here in this text of Scripture, it says, Whosoever putteth away his wife and marrieth another committeth adultery. And whoso marrieth her that is put away from her husband committeth adultery. Did you notice what's missing from Luke 16, 18 that's not missing from Matthew 19, 9? Both Mark 10, 11 and Luke 16, 18 give the general rule. The general rule is don't divorce, and if you do, you commit adultery. That's the general rule. There is an exception, and the only place it's located is Matthew 19, 9. Except it be for fornication. When I was a student at Freed Hardeman, I loved to go to our basketball games there in old Bader Gym, which is no more. And Bader Gym had uh, at the entrance to the gymnasium these little placards up above the entrance, no food and drink in gym. And then it said, except during ball games, on a different placard. And the other door... It said, no food and drink in the gym, but the placard that used to be up there, you could tell where it used to be pressed up against the wall because there was a spot there where you could tell something used to be fastened there, but it some fell or someone removed it accidentally, I don't know. But one door, if you entered it, it says, no food and drink in the gym, 
And if you just looked at that and that alone, you'd think never, ever under any circumstance can you have food in this gymnasium because it says no food or drink in the gym, period. But here's, uh, there is this one place, oh, except during ball games. Oh, there's the exception. I can do it if it's during the ball game. I can have food and drink in the gym. The general rule for Jesus, don't divorce, don't remarry. Because if you do, you'll commit adultery. Well, there is one exception. If you divorce for fornication and remarry, you haven't committed adultery if you marry an eligible partner, of course. And so here you see the general rule versus the exception to the rule. And so I want you to stop and think about this as it relates to Matthew chapter 5, because in the greatest sermon perhaps that has ever been preached on earth's soil, we see Matthew chapter 5, and Jesus Christ says something that a lot of folks... Uh, Forgot about maybe because they only focus on Matthew 19.9. Matthew 19.9 is great because it is what the Bible says, but Matthew 5 is also clear. It says in verse 31, It has been said, Jesus, what has been said? You might have heard it said, Whosoever shall put away his wife, well, just give her a bill of divorcement. Give her a writing of divorcement. Just go ahead and divorce her. And isn't it sad you've got folks today that if they go to work and tell their workers, co-workers, I'm having marriage problems, that some of those co-workers will just say, well, just divorce them. Like that's the answer every time. Jesus says, but I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, watch, saving for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery, and whosoever shall marry her that is divorced commits adultery, and so how does putting away my wife for a reason other than fornication cause her to commit adultery? Because if I put her away for a reason other than the scriptural reason, then I put her in a position where she has a temptation to contract another relationship which she has no right to do. And if she contracts that relationship, then she's committed adultery and I'm the one that put her in that position. And you know, with reference to this, some people say, well, you know, I think the, the Lord's church is just, some people have been way too strict on this. Well, let me ask you to go back to Matthew 19. I want to ask you one question, if I may. In Matthew 19, when the disciples heard the one reason that Jesus gave that would authorize a man to divorce their mate and remarry, what did they say in response to it? His disciples say unto him, verse 10, well, if the case of the man be so with his wife, it's, it's better not to marry. It's not good to marry. If, if these are the rules governing marriage and how long you have to stay in a marriage, we think it'd be better just not to marry. Listen, this would have been a perfect time for Jesus to say, I think you have really given too strict of an interpretation to what I just said. Did Jesus water down what he just said because of what the apostles just said? Yes or no? No. He said, well, there are some eunuchs, they were born that way from their mother's womb. There are some eunuchs that were made that way by men against their will. But he said, there are some who've made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. He that is able to receive it, let him receive it. These are the rules. You either accept them or you don't. But if you're going to go by the rules of marriage that I've given, these are the rules. Now, here he comes into my office when I'm just a young, young preacher boy. I mean, my first work, as a matter of fact. Gray-haired. And I'd known him for weeks before he ever shared this with me. He said, let me tell you about my situation. When I was in my 20s, I cheated on my wife. And she put me away, which she had every right to do. And from that moment on, I knew that I was a guilty party, a guilty put away party. And I was in my 20s, mind you. And yes, I've seen women that were attractive that I wanted to invite out on a date. I wanted to pursue 
many times I was tempted to think about pursuing a relationship and then I would ask myself, even if this woman said yes to my invitation to go on a date and even if it grew into something deeper and we got married, that marriage would not be approved of by God based on the scriptures, Matthew 19. I'd be committing adultery by doing that. And if I had 20, 30, 40, even 50 years of happiness with this person only to die and spend eternity lost, it, would that be a worthwhile trade? And so he said, I have lived celibate for all these decades because I want to please my Lord and I want to go live with him. Now that was back in the 1980s that he told me that. He has long since passed away. I want to ask you tonight, dear friends, do you think that Christian brother, who as far as I know died as a faithful Christian, do you think that he thinks he made the right decision, yes or no? You better know that he knows he made the right decision. It's not worth it to forfeit your eternal soul for a few years of happiness on earth with someone that God says you shouldn't be with. And yes, I know it can be emotional and I want to deal with this. It's, if you'll just let the Bible speak clearly, you don't have to get emotion all wrapped up in it. Two individuals came to Brother Guy in Woods and I heard him tell this in one of the last sermons that he preached on this earth before he passed away. It just happened to be in the area where he was preaching, and I attended the meeting, and he told the following story, and I know he told it other places too, so you might have heard it. He told of how this couple came up to him, and they said, Brother Woods, we highly respect your knowledge of the Scriptures and all the years that you've studied the Bible. And there's a passage that uh, is controversial, and we'd like to ask you for your analysis, your expert analysis. It's Matthew 19, 9. Would you tell us after all the years of study you spent on Matthew 19, 9 and in the Bible in general, would you tell us your expert analysis of Matthew 19, 9? And he said, I will, I will tell you uh, what Matthew 19, 9 means. Yes, my study is, has convicted me of the fact that it means whosoever shall put away his wife except to be for fornication and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whoso marrieth her that is put away doth commit adultery. Brother Woods, I don't think you understand what we're asking you. You, you quoted the passage, yes, but what is, okay, give us an exegesis of the passage. You know, draw out the meaning of it for us. Okay, here's, here's my exegesis of it. Whosoever shall put away his wife, Except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committed adultery. And whoso marrieth her that is put away doth commit adultery. Frustrated, this couple said, Brother Woods, all we're asking you to do is give us a commentary on it. If you were writing a commentary on it, what would you say? He said, I would say, Whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, Commit of adultery. And whoso marrieth her that is put away doth commit adultery. He says the passage doesn't need explaining near as much as it needs believing. And isn't that true tonight? Well, Brother Clark, you have a heart of stone about this. No, I really don't. And let me close out by telling you I think I know there's danger that lurks in the vicinity of compassion. I want to be a compassionate person. I really do because the Bible commands that. But there is danger that lurks in the vicinity of compassion. And it's the danger of the temptation to compromise what we clearly know God's Word says. Let me illustrate. I studied with a couple, and this couple became members of the church. I did learn in the course of our study that uh, she had been married before, but her husband had cheated on her and, and uh, she you know, made that clear. 
And so I understood that to be the case. She was really on fire for the Lord. I mean, quite frankly, she was someone that came to me on her own. And she said, you know, I, I work at a fitness place and they require us. They tell us they want us to wear tight spandex as part of our outfit to lead the fitness classes. And she said, learning what I'm learning about the Bible, I don't feel comfortable wearing tight clothing anymore. And so I'm going to, I quit the fitness place. Wow. Then one day I am preaching a sermon. And I just quoted Matthew 19, 9. I didn't even comment on it. I just quoted it and then moved on. And her husband came up to me after services. He said, if I heard what you quoted correctly, you need to come to my house this afternoon. I fear that I might be living in adultery. I said, oh, I hope not. But I'll come to your house, yes. So I get to his house. And he said, listen, he said, I've never been married. She has, but her husband used to travel as a salesman. And I saw her at the public pool. He said, I'm just leveling with you. She caught my eye and I caught hers. And we started uh, a relationship that led to, yes, we were, we were with one another in an intimate way. I said, while she was still married? He said, yes, absolutely, several times while she was still married. So I met with her and I explained to her, the Lord never envisioned in Matthew 19, 9, someone putting away their mate for doing the same thing they themselves have been doing. That this is not the Lord's idea that a guilty party could put away another guilty party for their guilt and yet not be held accountable for the guilt of their own actions. And this is why, brethren, this idea that the guilty party can remarry is preposterous for this reason. It gives the guilty party the same exact marriage entitlement that the innocent party has. And there's no way that the Lord would ever do that. The, you know what the man said as, as he looked at all the passages I showed him, he says, you're showing me exactly what the Bible says, but I'm not going to do it. Uh, here's what I want you to hear, please. I love this couple so much, and I was so impressed by so, many pro so much progress they had made. And I came home that night, and when I, when I opened the door, my wife was standing there, and I started crying. I'm not saying this to be superficial. I'm saying I started crying and crying pretty hard. She says, honey, what, what, is, what is wrong? I said, I love this couple so much and I want them to be able to stay together. I want that. Because they do seem like they really do love and care for one another. And then I said this, this must be where it starts for some preachers. Because there's a part of me right now that's tugging at me and wanting me to... Forget what I know the Bible comes right out and says and to just conveniently look the other way about that right now so that I can go to this couple and say, you're fine, just stay together. Just stay together. Everything's just fine. And I would feel happy for them, but then I realized I would be hurting them eternally. I'd be hurting myself eternally. I said, please pray with me right now that I will have the backbone to stand up for what is right even when it's emotionally hard to do that. Pray that I don't become one of those preachers who suddenly changes from his clear understanding of Matthew 19, 9 to seeing it as, well, it's really quite murky and confusing. Friends, it's not. It's the emotions that make it hard for us to admit what it clearly says. And that's why people look to places like 1 Corinthians 7, 15 and say, oh, the Pauline privilege. There's an extra privilege given in, in 1 Corinthians 7 for divorce and remarriage. It is, if, you're, if your mate, your unbelieving mate deserts you, then you're not under bondage. And they want to apply that to the marriage bond. But the problem with their argument is 
Paul knew the word for the marriage bond in Greek. In fact, he would used it in 1 Corinthians 7 in at least two other places. Are you bound unto a wife? Then he says, don't seek to be unbound. And he uses the word for marriage bond that's from a Greek word, deo, D-E-O. But the word he uses in 1 Corinthians 7.15 is used 130 plus times in the New Testament from doulos, and it's never, ever, ever, single time applied to the marriage bond. And Brother Owen Albright, in a piece that he wrote some years ago, I'll start closing with this, did a study of the negative perfect, which is the tense in which this is written in Greek. And he went through the New Testament studying the negative perfect, and this is what he learned as he wrote down his conclusions. He said this, in Greek, the perfect tense points to a condition that exists in the present because of an action performed in the past. But Brother Owen Albright went on to say that there are 94 instances where perfect tense verbs were used with the negative, and he said an investigation of these passages led to this conclusion. The meaning of a perfect with a negative is always this. The condition does not exist because it never did exist. So that can't be the marriage bond then, can it? Because if that's the marriage bond, it means you have not been bound to your mate, you are not now bound to your mate, and you never will be bound to your mate in any way. No, this is not what that is saying. This is saying... Well, Brother Albright goes on to summarize what Paul is saying is the Christian never was enslaved to force himself or herself on a non-Christian who wants to depart. They're never enslaved to the point that they have to give up their Christianity to keep the person from leaving. It's not about divorce and remarriage. Friends, God's Word is clear about marriage, divorce, and remarriage. And we've got to declare the truth on this matter. I told every one of my children, I love you dearly and I'll never stop loving you, but I can promise you this. If you enter into a relationship that is not approved of by God in Scripture, I will still love you, but I will not be able to endorse that relationship. I won't. I can't because i got to listen to God first. I don't know who will hear this and to whom this might apply, but I do know this. If I preach the Word of God, and that's what I've endeavored to do tonight, we're going to be accountable to it, not to me. And so may we leave this place tonight with a renewed conviction that what the Bible says is true, and if God said it, that settles it, whether I believe it or not.